Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 74. Today we're continuing our series on animal physiology by exploring a very important and very fundamental aspect of animal life. All organisms, be they plants, bacteria, fungi, animals, you name it, all organisms need water. Water is the stuff of life. It's the universal solvent, the polar solution that provides the fertile setting for the biochemistry of life. All organisms need water to stay hydrated. For example, water is the base substance that fills the cytoplasm of the cell, of all cells. It's the main component in the blood and the lymph and all of the internal body fluids of animals. Fungi can't engage in saprophytic digestion without water. Plants can't engage in photosynthesis without water. Animals can't move their muscles without water. Water provides the oxygen and the hydrogen that are needed for almost every organic reaction, to the point that, without water, life as we know it simply would not function. Full stop. So, with that said, acquiring water and drinking water is just as fundamental to animals as is acquiring food and air. Just as the food gives nutrients that get incorporated into the physical body of the animal, Water works as a sustaining solution, uh, as it keeps everything hydrated and it keeps everything working. Now this is a, a brutally simple explanation, because it's really not so simple as just consume water, be hydrated, done. I mean, that's about how simple it is for the animal's consciousness, for its awareness, you know, it's thirsty, so it drinks water, and then it's not thirsty. But for the animal's body, managing its water on a biochemical and physiological level involves a very complex balancing act of osmotic pressure and electrolyte concentrations. How an animal's body manages this osmotic pressure and these electrolytes will be the key focus of today's episode. So first things first, I need to go into some of the basics of the chemistry and the physics of water, so as to provide a context for how water is used in animals. So I'm sure you know that if you have a dry towel and you touch the, the corner of the towel to some water, it's going to absorb the water. This is osmosis, as the water is moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. Diffusion is a general term, and it means the movement of a substance from areas of high concentration to low concentration, like, you know, things will spread out as the individual particles in the solution bounce around. Things tend to disperse and eventually become homogenous. You know this if you've ever put a couple of drops of food coloring in a jar of water, and then you can either watch it diffuse and dissolve throughout the water, or you can shake it up a bit to make it dissolve and spread out faster. All right, so to bring this back to biology, much like the plants and fungi, animal cells have membranes. But unlike the plants and fungi, Animal cells have no cell walls. They're soft and squishy and uh, pliable. They can bend and respond to the environment around them. And another benefit of not having a cell wall is that water can freely flow between the phospholipids and through the, the protein channels in the cell's membrane. Water can easily flow in and out of the cell. However, the particles in the solution, like nutrients and hormones and whatever else, may not be able to pass through the membrane as easily as water. The cell's membrane is selectively permeable, and it can inherently separate volumes of a solution, like you have the inside and outside of a cell. Each of these volumes of liquid can contain different concentrations of chemicals, or solutes. If the concentration of a solute outside of the cell is high, and inside of the cell it's low, then the rule of diffusion will see a net movement of the solute across the cell's membrane into the cell. This net movement across the membrane establishes a concentration gradient. The gradient is stronger with larger differences between high and low. So it's kind of like pressure. If you open your front door, the pressure change is negligible because the pressure inside and outside of your house was always similar. But if you open the front door of the International Space Station, the pressure difference between the inside and the vacuum of space on the outside, the difference there is massive, and so if you open the door, it'll result in an explosive decompression. The force of the air moving through the door is analogous to the chemical energy of a concentration gradient. A stronger concentration gradient is like a stronger flow of air, 
or like the flow of water in a river. The key detail here is that these physical phenomena can be tapped, and energy can be extracted and used for other things. This is hugely important in biology, where various types of concentration gradients, like that of protons, are sustained so as to yield energy to fuel other enzymatic reactions. The water provides the solution for all of these concentration gradients to exist within, and without that water as a relatively neutral polar solution, you wouldn't have the playing field for these neat biological reactions to be set up and sustained. All right, now here is where it gets hairy. The concentration of water is associated with the concentration of solutes. So if you have a volume of water and you add some solutes to it, then necessarily the concentration of solutes will increase and the concentration of water will decrease. The concentration of solutes in a solution like this is called the osmolarity. If there's a cell with a membrane somewhere, and inside of the cell are large solutes that can't pass through the membrane, then there's a higher osmolarity inside of the cell than the outside, because it ultimately has a higher solute concentration. More solutes equals a higher osmolarity, but it also means a lower water concentration. And as per the rules of diffusion, water will flow from high to low concentration. So in this scenario, where you have a cell with a, lot of, uh, with a high osmolarity because it has these large solutes inside of it, in this scenario, water will flow into the cell from the outside, and the cell will expand. I talked about this a lot in episode 50 on plant hydration, and ultimately what's trying to happen here is that the natural process is trying to normalize the concentration inside the cell with the solution outside the cell. So inside the cell has a high solute concentration, water will come in to try and dilute it and bring that solute concentration down. Just as in plants, animals also have to keep a healthy osmotic balance, a healthy osmolarity, and this will help keep their cells healthy and functioning properly. However, sometimes this can be thrown out of whack, which causes osmotic stress. There are some organisms, like jellyfish, sponges, and flatworms, that are osmoconformers. And this means that their bodies have about the same osmolarity inside as the ocean water outside. So they don't really have to worry too much about osmotic stress. Whatever it is in the ocean, it'll affect them directly, and that's what they deal with. They're osmoconformers. However, more complex animals aren't as lucky. You know, their bodies aren't so simple that they can, they can be an osmoconformer. Sometimes animals evolve complexity that requires specialized internal conditions to be sustained. And so, they had to evolve means of osmoregulation to manage this flow of water and the electrolyte concentration inside their tissues. These more complex organisms have tissues that are not at the same solute concentration as the ocean water, and so they have to engage in perpetual osmoregulation to keep their cells, water, and electrolyte concentrations in balance. In ocean-dwelling fish, for example, their tissues have fewer solutes than the surrounding ocean water, and so that means that water passing through their gills will tend to deposit electrolytes, but the fish will actually lose water out of their tissues. Electrolytes are coming in and water is being expelled in an attempt to bring the internal solute concentration up so it matches the, the outside ocean water. And this can actually be dangerous for these marine fish, because if too many solutes diffuse into their tissues, their cells will expel so much water that they'll shrink, wrinkle, and die. To account for this, the fish has to drink a lot of seawater to replace the water lost through osmosis. But remember, the ocean water has a higher solute concentration than the fish itself, so this water that it's drinking also has a lot of solutes in it. And in response to all of this solute buildup in their tissues, the saltwater fish will actively transport electrolytes out of their cells to attempt to lower the osmolarity and thus lower the rate of water loss. This is the exact opposite scenario for freshwater fish. Freshwater, like you would find in lakes or streams fed by something like glacial or mountain meltwater, this freshwater is relatively free of solutes, so the solute concentration of the tissue of a freshwater fish is generally much higher than that of the water around it. The relatively high osmolarity inside the freshwater fish's cells will bring water in through osmosis, and their cells can swell up like an overfilled water balloon. 
If this problem isn't taken care of, their cells can actually burst, leading to injury and death. Furthermore, solutes will flow along their concentration gradient where they, they try to leach out of the fish's tissues and out into the water, because the water has a lower solute concentration than the inside of the fish's cells. In response to this leak of solutes, the freshwater fish will actively transport electrolytes into their cells to try to stem the tide of outgoing solute diffusion. And unlike the marine fish, the freshwater fish don't drink any water at all. They don't need to drink because their cells naturally absorb all the water and they're, they're risking overhydration as it is. And if this wasn't quite weird enough, even though the freshwater fish don't drink at all, they urinate a lot because they have to get rid of all of this excess water. So this brings me to an interesting question. How do the fish pump solutes into or out of their cells? This is a really important topic that extends way beyond fish to pretty much every plant, fungi, protist, and microbe alive today. Everything has cells with membranes, and these membranes are studded with proteins. Many of these proteins take the shape of tubes or tunnels that penetrate the membrane and create a pore, or a channel for a particular solute to flow through. Other proteins may have a binding site for a solute, and upon binding with that solute, they'll change conformation to carry the solute across the membrane. The simplest example of this is passive transport. The channel allows a solute to simply flow across the membrane according to its concentration gradient, with no energy cost to the cell. Many channels, which are just protein tubes, are shaped in specific ways, such that only one type of solute can flow through them. For example, water flows through the membrane mainly through pores called aquaporins. This process is just super simple basic diffusion. The water just tumbles through the aquaporin like the hole in your shower drain. Also, you should understand that diffusion is the only way that water is moved. A water molecule itself isn't necessarily going to be moved by a protein. The things that get moved by these uh, membrane proteins are like ions, like sodium or potassium, or maybe more complex ligands, like a hormone or some kind of uh, sugar signaling molecule, you know, something like that. Water itself just usually flows through the aquaporins. It's not actively carried across the membrane, because there's, there's no real need to do that, because water can make it across just as easily on its own. Now, in cases where the carrier protein moves the solute by changing conformation, the binding of the solute requires no energy. And the act of binding, the, this electrochemical charge or whatever it might have that the solute brings to the membrane protein, it will naturally change the conformation of the protein. The shape of the protein will dictate how it moves the solute. And in this case, its shape change will bring the solute like it'll drag it across the membrane. The conformational shape change will also weaken the binding affinity of the protein to the solute. So the solute is let go to float freely on whichever side of the membrane it got deposited. And the carrier protein, having let go of the solute, will then revert back to its original conformation. Now this whole process is really cool, because no energy is needed at all to power these conformational changes. They just happen automatically as the polar molecules in the protein react to the electronegativity or the polarity or something in the solute. More complex than passive transport are the various forms of active transport that are used to move solutes across the membrane. Now, unlike passive transport, active transport involves the cell expending energy, like ATP, to operate enzymes that actively move solutes against their concentration gradient. The proteins that are involved in active transport are typically called pumps because they work to pump solutes from areas of low to high concentration. In primary active transport, for example, ATP is used to power the sodium-potassium pumps that move sodium and potassium across the cellular membranes. This is really important for cell membrane potential and pH, especially in neural cells in the brain. In secondary active transport, the pump can tap into the energy of a pre-existing chemical gradient to power itself and push some other solute against its concentration gradient. If an organism is suffering osmotic stress, it doesn't actively transport water itself. Instead, it will utilize these pumps and transporter proteins 
to move solutes in or out of its cell. Remember that water flows in the direction of high osmolarity, of higher solute concentration. So if the cells have a higher osmolarity than the surrounding water, water will flow into the cells and cause them to swell. To counter this, the animal must pump solutes out of the cells so the osmotic gradient isn't as strong and it doesn't uh, bring in as much water. Conversely, if cells have a lower osmolarity than the surrounding water, water will flow out of the cells and cause them to shrink. To counter this, the animal must pump solutes into their cells, so the osmotic gradient becomes larger and encourages water to flow into the cells. This is a perpetual chemical balancing act in both cases. Alright, now I talked about osmotic regulation in saltwater and freshwater fish, but what about land animals? Compared to aquatic animals, land animals exist in a very dry environment. The rocky dirt and the open air is a lot drier than a literal body of water. And, as a result, water will rapidly evaporate out of the tissues of land animals. Evaporation is actually one of the biggest pressures working against animals that live on land. You know, a lot of their, their drinking and their hydration has to do with counterbalancing evaporation. Now, evaporation is most extensive in thin, moist tissues with a very high surface area, like the alveoli of the lungs. Land animals have to urinate, and this too will cost them water. Some land animals will sweat or pant to cool down, and this too costs them a lot of water. Because of all of these things that land animals have to balance, you know, evaporation, urination, uh, panting for thermal regulation, because of all of these things, death by dehydration is a serious risk for land animals, and so they all have to regularly consume water by drinking. The management of this internal water balance involves many factors besides just solute concentration. It also involves flushing out nitrogenous waste compounds that are toxic if they're retained within the body. So nitrogen is present in many biomolecules, like the amino acids that make proteins, and the nucleic acids that make RNA and DNA. In the course of regular cellular activity, many of these nitrogen-containing substances are broken down, and some nitrogen will end up bound to hydrogen atoms as NH3, or ammonia. Ammonia is a relatively basic chemical, and so it can screw up the pH of the cellular environment, and that can be dangerous if not outright deadly. In many animals, like mammals, for example, this ammonia is converted into urea, which is then excreted in liquid form as urine. In other animals, like bugs, reptiles, and birds, the ammonia is converted to uric acid. This is a thick, white goop, or a paste, which the bird, or the bug, or the reptile will then poop out. To examine how this works in vertebrates, let's take a deeper look at the kidney. The kidney is the organ responsible for water and electrolyte balance in vertebrate animals, and because the kidneys are so important, they tend to come in pairs, for redundancy. Alright, now in a nutshell, blood that's rich in nitrogenous waste is brought into the kidney through the renal artery. The kidney will then clean the blood and filter out this nitrogenous waste, and deposit the waste into a stream of water flowing from the ureter into the bladder. The renal vein will then carry away the cleaned blood to bring it back into the organism's body, back into the greater circulation. In order to do what the kidney does, the kidneys have to manipulate and move the water around on a chemical level. But this happens entirely through the movement of solutes, not through the active transport of water itself. The kidney moves solutes by exploiting strong concentration gradients, and in order to do this, it sets up a crazy cellular tube structure called a nephron. Now each kidney is composed of about a million nephrons, and these all feed water, thick with nitrogenous waste, to the bladder. There are four major regions to the nephron, which I'll briefly cover. These are the renal corpuscle, the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, and the distal tubule which then feeds into the collecting duct, which collects all the urine, feeds it down the ureter into the bladder. Okay, so let's go through the kidney like we were a piece of nitrogenous waste flowing through the blood. 
As we go through the renal artery, we'll notice that the, the, the renal artery will start to split up into smaller and smaller capillaries, and these capillaries will end in terminal knots, or globular masses of veins called a glomerulus. This glomerulus, this fluffy nodule of vascular tissue, is wrapped in the renal corpuscle, which is covered in slits and pores that facilitate the filtration of water and small solutes out of the glomerulus. The pressure of the heartbeat is what provides you know, some of the internal pressure to help push the solutes out, to, to, to push them through the filters into the renal corpuscle. The glomerulus filters passively, with no energy input, and they filter a massive amount of fluid every day. About 180 liters of blood, or more than 40 gallons, gets filtered through each kidney every day. This fluid that's filtered into the renal corpuscle from the bloodstream contains both water and nitrogenous wastes, among other types of small solutes, and it all flows into the proximal tubule. The inner epithelial lining of this tubule is forested with little microvilli, which are tiny projections coming out of the cell that vastly increase the tubule's internal surface area. These microvilli are packed with active transport proteins and mitochondria. The active transport proteins work really hard to extract all of the valuable solutes that aren't waste, like vitamins and other nutrients and stuff like that, and these active transporters will pull them out of the filtrate and return them to the body. This process is critical, but it also uses a lot of energy. It uses a lot of ATP, which is why these cells have a very high density of mitochondria. The mitochondria is pretty much the powerhouse of the cell, that produces all of the ATP that these cells need. So after we pass through the proximal tubule, where all of the more useful vitamins have been removed, the filtrate will flow into the very important loop of Henle. So the renal corpuscle is kind of like a spherical pocket, and the proximal tubule is a short, tangled tube that hangs off of the spherical pocket. The loop of Henle is the later part of the tube that suddenly descends straight down some variable distance towards the core of the kidney medulla, before making a looping turn and coming straight back up. To make a really rough uh, skating metaphor, the loop of Henle is kind of shaped like a half pipe. It goes down, it turns, and then it comes back up. Now, as the fluid flows down the descending part of the loop, water will leak out in high quantities. A lot of water is going to leak out here, and it'll feed back into the surrounding matrix of cells. As a result of this, the water concentration in the loop of Henle will rapidly drop, and the filtrate in the loop becomes heavy with solutes. The solute concentration goes way up. This water outflow is caused by the osmotic gradient set up farther along the loop, in the part that's coming back up. In this ascending part of the loop, water doesn't leak out like it does in the descending part, but instead, ions like sodium and chlorine will leak out. Further up the loop, these ions are being actively pumped out, which lowers the osmolarity of the filtrate. All of these ions getting pumped out of the ascending part of the loop of Henle increases the solute concentration in the nearby cells, which will then pull water out of the descending part of the loop. So, it's a self-reinforcing cycle that maintains an osmotic gradient within the kidney. All of the vitamins and nutrients and ions extracted from the nephron so far are all reabsorbed by a mesh of blood vessels wrapping around the nephron, which carries these critical nutrients back into the bloodstream. At this point, the filtrate still in the nephron is at the end of the loop of Henle, and it's entering the distal tubule. The filtrate has a low concentration of useful solutes like vitamins and nutrients, because at this point they've mostly all been pumped out, and it does have a high concentration of both water and waste solutes, like urea. It flows from the loop of Henle into the distal tubule, which will then feed it into the collecting duct, where this waste will then flow down the ureters into the bladder, or the cloaca. Now this may seem simple, but it's a critical juncture for water absorption. If the animal is dehydrated, it can't afford to lose too much water in its waste. There's hormones, like antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone, that work to increase the permeability to water in the distal tubule and the collecting duct. And this increase in water permeability will increase the amount of water that's extracted and saved from the waste filtrate. In dehydrated animals, 
This will lead to urine that has a very low water concentration and a very high urea concentration, which makes the urine appear a dark yellow with a very strong odor. On the other hand, a very well hydrated animal can afford to lose more water in the urine, so these hormones, like antidiuretic hormone, they're not as active, and so the urine is more diluted with water, and this makes it a paler yellow or a clear color with a relatively weak odor. The kidney is a remarkably refined organ, which makes it very effective and very powerful. This is good because the biological demands that are put on the kidney are very high. Filtering waste out of dozens and dozens of gallons of blood every day is no small task, and it takes a very tightly and very carefully regulated dance between all of the different concentration gradients to make it work. But of course, this is how it works only in vertebrate animals. Invertebrate animals, like arthropods, have just as much need for osmoregulation, but they have a radically different physiology set up to do it. So first, let's consider how insects breathe. The insects breathe through a very thin layer of epithelial tissue that permeates their bodies like a network, kind of like a subway. At certain points, this epithelial layer is exposed to the dry air, and gas exchange occurs through diffusion. Carbon dioxide diffuses out, oxygen diffuses in, and water vapor can potentially be lost. This epithelial layer lines the inside of a network of tubes, called a tracheal network, or a tracheal system. And this is what I was referring to when I said it was kind of like a subway system. You have this, this network of tubes that permeates through the animal's body, and it's kind of like an air-based version of a vasculature to remove waste carbon dioxide and bring in oxygen. This tracheal network is exposed to the external environment at little points along the surface of the animal's body. These points, or pores, are called spiracles. These spiracles can open and close to let gases in or out, and they can open or close to regulate water evaporation. Instead of blood, insects have a fluid called hemolymph, which generally serves the same purpose as blood. The hemolymph is circulated throughout the body by the pumping action of the heart, and within this circulation, the hemolymph carries all of these nutrients and oxygen and all of the good stuff that keeps the animal alive. To get rid of the waste that build up in the hemolymph, these land-based invertebrates use structures called malpighian tubules. These tubules are in contact with the hemolymph, and they have potassium pumps that are used to extract potassium from the hemolymph which then accumulates within the tubules. This increases the solute concentration in the tubules. It increases the osmolarity, and this, in turn, will bring in water through osmosis. This water flow allows nitrogenous waste to come into the tubules as well, where it forms a pre-urine filtrate. This filtrate will then flow into the hindgut, which is kind of like a repository for waste, except the insect can tap the hindgut and extract water if it happens to be too dehydrated. Useful things, like nutritious electrolytes and non-waste compounds, are selectively reabsorbed from the hindgut, while the waste products remain and accumulate. In most insects, up to 95% of the water in these malpighian tubules is reabsorbed, and since the urea is left behind in the hindgut, it'll get excreted as a dense, relatively dry mass of solutes. All right, so I've talked about these mechanisms in relative detail for land-dwelling creatures, so let me return to the oceans, to the lakes and rivers, to briefly retouch on how fish manage their osmoregulation on a cellular, physiological level. Remember that for jellyfish and corals and other simple animals like that, they don't really need to bother with osmoregulation, because the water and the solute concentrations inside their bodies is pretty much identical to the concentration outside their bodies, in the ocean water. For this reason, these organisms are called osmoconformers. They conform to the osmolarity around them. But more complex aquatic organisms, like most fish, are osmoregulators, because they have to constantly work to maintain a proper osmotic balance in a marine environment that doesn't match that within their body. So recall from earlier in the episode that fresh water tends to have a low solute concentration, much lower than the solute concentration inside the cells of freshwater fish. This means that water flows into the fish's cells 
and causes those cells to expand. And it also means that solutes will flow out of the fish, going from high concentration in the fish's cells to the low solute concentration of the fresh water. To stop this outflow, the fish actively transport solutes back into their cells. But because this act increases the osmolarity of their cells, it will also increase the amount of water coming into their cells. And because this is already a problem, doing something actively that encourages that problem to get worse, well, you can see how this can become a fatal, non-viable solution if there's, if there's no way to regulate that water. But fortunately for the freshwater fish, their life is viable. You know, they do exist. They have evolved some means to deal with this. And to maintain that balance, the freshwater fish don't actively drink any water at all because they get all the water they need from this diffusion dynamic. Now, this is all well and good if you're just a freshwater fish who spends all their time in fresh water. But keep in mind that not all freshwater fish live in fresh water their whole lives. Some fish, like salmon, have a life cycle that involves transitioning between freshwater and saltwater, which necessarily means that they need the cellular capacity to actively transport solutes both into their tissues and out of their tissues, depending on the osmolarity of the water in which they are currently swimming. Some recent research has shown that these fish may actually possess two groups of epithelial cells in their gills dedicated to each kind of solute transport. One group of cells is active in freshwater, pumping solutes into the body. And the other group of cells is active in salt water, pumping solutes out of the body. Additionally, there are even different types of sodium and potassium pumps, and these are expressed at different times in the fish's life, and in response to the external environment. There's also some pumps that have been shown to move from one side of the cell to the other, so as to facilitate solute pumping in either direction at a moment's notice. So these are just some of the general ways in which animals manage their water reserves to keep themselves hydrated, healthy, and alive. I found it really interesting studying animal hydration, especially in some of my college classes, because the way my professors described it would really help me visualize life as this constantly flowing chemical architecture, and organisms are this dynamic, breathing entity with a body full of complex, swelling and flowing and raising and lowering concentration gradients and expanding and shrinking cells, all morphing and bubbling along together in this beautifully regulated water dance. It's just incredible how it all works together seamlessly. And with that said, that's the end of the episode. There's your rundown on animal hydration. I hope you found this episode educational and thought-provoking, and at the very least, I hope you found it entertaining. In the next episode, episode 75, I'll be exploring the chemical dynamics of animal nutrition. I'll talk about how animals get their nutrients from their food of choice, and how this affects their bodies, and their behavior, and their evolution. And as always, thanks for listening.